webinar on uh, the OSCE. My name is uh, Fleming Spitzbold Hansen. I'm a senior researcher uh, at DIES, uh, the Danish Institute for International Studies. And it's my pleasure to host this webinar, uh, which is on the OSCE 2021. So I decided to put together this webinar to take a look at the OSCE, a, uh, an overview of uh, some of the issues, uh, burning important issues that uh, are covered by the OSCE and which of course concern uh, very many of us. So we have a spectacular lineup today. Uh, we have three speakers, each representing different parts of what the OSCE uh, does today. First, we'll go to the Swedish chairpersonship and Sweden of course holds the chairpersonship this year and has a very interesting agenda. Now in the uh, invitation to this webinar, I decide to focus on the gender aspect, which I think and I know is very important uh, and central uh, to the work of, uh, of uh, the Swedish representatives right now. But actually the agenda is sort of being branded as going back to basics. So it's very interesting and, and we'll learn more about this. Then we'll go to uh, the Conflict Prevention Center a key institution in the OEC and one of course, which is very sought after and very important right now when we have conflict and uh, we'll learn more about what it is that the uh, conflict prevention center is doing, how it handles various conflicts and what it can do in some of those hotspots that, uh, that we see also uh, in, uh, within Europe. And then finally, we'll go to the international secretariat of the parliamentary assembly uh, which is located here in Copenhagen. And we'll learn more about the work that they do, uh, which includes, of course, democratization, parliamentary uh, cooperation, uh, and, uh, and, and um, uh, the diffusion of a positive agenda when it comes to political reforms um, throughout also the uh, OSCE participating states uh, area. Um, we have, of course, three speakers. They'll be representing each of these uh, themes. They'll be representing these different uh, uh, institutions. First, we'll go to Petra Leake, who is the Swedish OSE ambassador and who will be representing today the uh, Swedish chairpersonship. We'll go to Ambassador Atula Uyula, who is director of the Conflict Prevention Center uh, in Vienna. And then finally, we'll go to Gustavo Poyades, who is uh, Deputy Secretary General of the International Secretariat in, uh, in Copenhagen. Um, for, you, for all of you uh, out there, uh, there's an opportunity for you to ask questions as we go along. Uh, please, if you go to the bottom of your screen, you will see the Q&A uh, button. You click that and then you are free to answer your, uh, to ask your questions and we'll uh, pick those up uh, as we go along. Uh, we'll do the, the webinar in three sort of more or less separate sections. Uh, and you will have question, uh, an opportunity to ask questions as you go along. And then perhaps by the end of it, if you have any, if you have any remaining questions, we may uh, look at those also. But please go ahead and, uh, and uh, submit your questions and I'll uh, try to handle them and present them to uh, our speakers. With that, I suggest that we get started. We have a busy agenda. We have two hours in front of us. And um, I would like to uh, give the floor to uh, Ambassador Petra Lerke, who is here to speak on behalf of the OSE chairpersonship. So please, Petra. Thank you very much, Fleming. And just to clarify, perhaps that I'm indeed an ambassador and working on the OSE, but I am the head of the Swedish uh, task force that has been set up to manage our uh, chairpersonship. So we have uh, an OSE ambassador also in Vienna. Her name is Ulrika Funered. Um, but uh, let me start by, by thanking you um, for inviting me to discuss some of these issues, uh, some of the issues that Sweden is now facing in this year as chair of the OSCE. Today's seminar is indeed very timely, both because of the many challenges in the OSCE region um, and also for us as uh, chair in order to take stock of almost four months of a chairpersonship. Let me also thank the Danish Institute for International Affairs for hosting this event, which I understand will enable us to reflect also on the broader issues of the OSCE in the context of the European security order. My role, of course, is to represent the Swedish OSCE chairpersonship, so I will comment on these issues uh, from that perspective. I will give you an overview of uh, how we see our task as chair 
inform you about our priorities, how these play into the topic of our seminar today, gender, conflict settlement and democratization, and finally make a few remarks on the way ahead. But I would like to begin by sharing some reflections on why we need to safeguard the, the values and the principles on which the OSC is based and which form the central uh, pillar of European security and stability. Last time Sweden held the chairpersonship of the OSC was back in 1993. Back then our role as chair coincided with a new era of cooperation that had emerged in Europe after the Cold War. The Helsinki Charter of 1975 had been supplemented with the Paris Charter of 1991. The European Security Conference was only a couple of years from becoming the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. It represented a new collective security arrangement for a new era that had seen the peaceful dismantling of the Soviet Union, but also the outbreak of conflict in former Yugoslavia and around Nagorno-Karabakh. At Helsinki in Paris, Paris, the participating states committed to respect each other's sovereignty, territorial integrity, right to choose security paths, and to refrain from uh, threat or use of force. Underpinning these documents are, of course, international law and the Charter of the United Nations. Together, they are at the heart of the European security order. Today, this order is being challenged on multiple fronts. Old rivalries continue to fuel conflicts in our part of the world, and the situation is made even more difficult by increased geopolitical tension. This is obvious in the conflict in and around Ukraine, in Georgia and Moldova, and between Armenia and Azerbaijan. On top of this, new crises and threats demand our attention, from climate change to cybersecurity. We're in the midst of a pandemic, which has brought about vast human costs, new strains on open society and disruption uh, to economic activity around the world. Our vulnerabilities have been exposed. Democracy, economic development and respect for human rights have suffered in many parts of the OSC region. And these tensions and challenges are being reflected in the multilateral work also of the OSC as an organization through occasional blockages and vetoes. Our task as chair is to navigate through these challenges towards common solutions. To guide our efforts, we seek to emphasize a few specific themes. Our general approach, as Fleming stated in the beginning, is to go back to basics, to the fundamental norms and principles on which the OSC was founded and on which the European security order rests. These commitments remain valid and relevant and we will remind participating states of the need to respect and implement them. In our view, this is the primary task of a shared person in office. Moreover, we seek to strengthen the OSC's unique comprehensive concept of security, which makes a clear link between security and the respect for human rights, democracy and the rule of law. Through this concept, we try to contribute to conflict resolution in the OSC region. There is a lot of research indicating that societies where human rights are fully enjoyed by all are more secure and enjoy better prospects for sustainable, resilient and prosperous development. This is why gender equality and women's economic empowerment and also the agenda for women, peace and security are guiding themes of our time as chairs. One of the main priorities for our chairpersonship is to see continued engagement at the highest level towards sustainable solutions to crises and conflicts in our region. They need to be carried out in line with international law and with the full respect uh, for OSC principles and commitments. Even if it, each conflict is case specific, we seek to keep in mind those main priorities that I have just outlined. For instance, the gender perspective is relevant in most situations of conflict resolution and also in democratization and safeguarding of human rights around our region. Women are often at the forefront of democratization efforts and tend to be amongst the most vulnerable in crisis situations. As part of our efforts, the chairperson in office has set out to visit all the countries 
hosting conflicts and field offices in the OSCE region to gain first-hand impressions from uh, people affected by the conflict and uh, also of human rights violations and abuses and to learn from the people who work in the field offices and also in other relevant institutions in these countries. Uh, moving on perhaps to the conflict resolution part of our uh, chairpersonship. The recent uh, weeks and the events that have uh, occurred have shown the fragility of the crisis in and around Ukraine and that this situation remains the most serious challenge through the European uh, security order. Seven years into this crisis, it is clear that efforts towards conflict resolution need to intensify. This is why on her first trip as OSCE chairperson, uh, Foreign Minister Anne Linde in January visited both Kiev and the contact line in Donbass. She underlined the need for a sustainable political solution in line with OSCE commitments and principles, uh, respecting the sovereignty, the territorial integrity and the independence of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders. This was also a key message uh, on the foreign minister's trip to, uh, to Moscow in February and has been recurring features in her phone conversations with Ukrainian foreign minister Kuleba and Russian foreign minister Lavrov uh, that she spoke to recently regarding the increased tension in and around Ukraine. With a special monitoring mission in Ukraine, the OSC contributes with the largest international presence on the ground to verify the implementation of the Minsk agreements and the ceasefire in Donbass. One of the foreign minister's first priorities as chair is to consolidate the ceasefire in Ukraine and to lessen the human suffering that results from the conflict. This was also something that uh, chairperson in office Linda discussed over the phone with the secretary general to the UN, Antonio Guterres, uh, earlier this week. In February, uh, the CIO visited Georgia and met with uh, President Surabashvili and then Prime Minister Gakharia to reiterate the OSCE's full support for the Geneva international discussions and the related incident prevention and response mechanism formats. Georgia is yet another example of where the European security order is being challenged. And as CIO, we are adamant to continue to keep it high on the political agenda. In CIO Linda's talks with President Sandu and other leaders in Moldova uh, in February, the prospects to move forward with talks about Transnistria in the so-called 5 plus 2 format uh, were also uh, carried out. She also confirmed our readiness to hold the 5 plus 2 talks in Stockholm during the year, provided that there is uh, uh, progress to discuss. This message was reiterated uh, in the discussions the CIO had with representatives from Transnistria and was generally well received. Uh, it is clear that the issues discussed in this process relate to the everyday lives of citizens in the region and, and uh, uh, refer to such uh, perhaps mundane things as registration of cars and the establishment of public transport lines between the two sides of the mystery river. But often it is those concrete issues that can start, can be the start of rebuilding of confidence and trust between two societies. Um, regarding the settlement of, on Transnistria, we remain realistic. Um, but there is some cause for cautious optimism in order to make progress on the settlement process during the year. In order to have progress, of course, the full support of all parties to the conflict is needed. Moving on to the unresolved Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, uh, this also remains a challenge to international peace and security. Last autumn, we witnessed a renewed outbreak of armed conflict, resulting in uh, thousands of casualties and immense suffering, including among civilians. The ceasefire achieved in November with the assistance of Russia brought about a welcome stop to hostilities, but the challenge now is to renew efforts towards a lasting peace agreement. The OSCE has been, give, been given the international mandate to lead this process under the auspices of the OSCE Minsk Group co-chairs. 
as chairperson in office, Mrs. Linda visited both Baku and Yerevan in March and is expressed her expectation that the sides recommit to talks on a sustainable political solution and to address uh, a number of humanitarian needs. It is in situation, situations as these where trusts between states have eroded uh, that confidence and security building measures play a specifically a specific role and unique role to support transparency and predictability. Our task as chair is to call on all participating states of the OSCE to comply with these measures that are at the heart of confidence and security building in our region. This includes, of course, the Vienna document and the Open Skies Treaty. These uh, measures and instruments need to be kept up to date and fully complied with, and they should comprise as many states as possible uh, to ensure that they function uh, fully and remain relevant. Only two weeks ago, Sweden as CIO hosted meet two meetings in Vienna on the request of Ukraine, as they wanted more information on unusual military activity in the Russian Federation under the provisions of the Vienna document on military transparency. And this, I think, goes to show that the tools for transparency and confidence building are highly relevant in today's conflicts. When crises erupt, and despite our efforts to prevent them, we remain ready to engage with, directly with the stakeholders involved in order to offer OSCE's good offices and facilitate solutions. In line with this, the offer that um, Albania's Prime Minister uh, Rama, as then chairperson in office, and uh, Foreign Minister Linde extended last year to facilitate a genuine dialogue between the government and the opposition in Belarus, this offer still stands. But it is, there is a, a worry among participating states uh, that the, there is a, a trend towards backsliding of democracy and respect for human rights all over the OSCE region. And this has been exacerbated during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, as I said, this is a, it's a concern and we will emphasize the right to the freedom of expression and the freedom of media, as well as other democratic uh, freedoms, which our states uh, have committed to respect. As chair, our efforts are carried out in support of and complementary to the work done by the OSCE Office for Dem Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, uh, referred to as ODIR, the representative on freedom of the media and the High Commissioner for National Minorities. These autonomous institutions all have clear and strong mandates. Together with them, we will do what we can to ensure that the OSCE can prevent conflicts and safeguard human rights. As chair, we also seek to draw on the expertise of civil society to ensure that their contribution uh, informs all of our efforts. Mrs. Linda has made it a priority to meet with civil society organizations from across the OSCE region in preparation of her field trips, conferences, and public appearances. We strongly believe uh, in supporting these networks. It's through them that we can uh, embody the ideals from the OSCE um, and also support people-to-people -people contacts uh, throughout the region. Our focus on women, peace and security uh, and that agenda will continue throughout, throughout our chairpersonship. This is important also in view of the COVID-19 pandemic. Women and girls are amongst the uh, most disproportionately affected by this global tragedy. The chairperson in office has pointed out that as we seek to lift our economies and societies after the pandemic, we need to build back better for a more, more equal and gender equal society. And we need to do it in ways that have a positive and lasting effect on the autonomy, resilience and opportunities of women and girls. As chair, we will also seek to mainstream the women, peace and security agenda throughout the dimensions of the OSCE work, including in the field missions and in cooperation with the autonomous institutions. The chairperson in office has also appointed an advisory group of experts on these issues, which held its first meeting at the end of February. Through their support, which 
uh, help, which uh, we hope uh, will gain further momentum. Uh, we also want to continue uh, this uh, advisory group and we hope to be able to pass on the baton to Poland and successive OSCE chairs. I have outlined some of the issues that will be on our agenda this year. They will also be reflected in the multilateral work in Vienna and in our contacts with capitals and also in our outreach activities. Just a few words on uh, some of the most recent uh, events. Uh, last week, CIO Linda visited Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, where she had productive meetings with political leaders. OSC representatives and to civil society organizations, as I just referred to. It was apparent from the CIO's meetings uh, that the OSC has a role both in assisting these states in living up to their commitments, but also uh, in meeting the security challenges that are present in this region. Uh, we saw a region that is highly affected by the peace process in Afghanistan and where the withdrawal of international troops this fall uh, will present a new situation. During the coming months, the CIO also plans to visit other OC field presences across southeastern Europe and the Western Balkans. The contribution of the OSC field offices to the comprehensive concept of security in these house countries make them a truly unique tool in the toolbox of the international community in her various deliberations and statements, CIO Linda will continue to highlight the priorities that I have outlined here today, while seeking common ground also on the many other challenges on the OSCE agenda. On Monday, uh, this Monday, she briefed the UN Security Council on cooperation between the OSCE and the UN, and next week, uh, Foreign Minister Linda will brief the Council of Europe in Strasbourg on the work that we are carrying out. And as we approach the ministerial meeting in Stockholm in December, we hope that these efforts uh, and other efforts will have made positive contribution uh, to advancing the OSCE agenda of peace, prosperity and respect for human rights. And more fundamentally, to the safeguarding of the norms, principles and commitments on which the European security order rests. I thank you so much for your attention and I am ready to answer any questions. Thank you uh, very much, Petra, for this introduction. Now, as I said in, in, in my introduction, uh, the OSE is a very important uh, regional security organization. And I think that your uh, introduction to your work has really highlighted this uh, when I sort of count the number of conflicts that you need to deal with, plus everything else that is also on the agenda, a very important agenda. It highlights, of course, uh, the central role of, of uh, this organization. Let me remind you as we, uh, we start uh, with the questions that you can submit your questions in the Q&A uh, part of the screen. If you go to the bottom of your screen, you click the uh, Q&A button and, and you may uh, submit your questions. Let me just start while the questions uh, come in. Let me ask you about the back to basics. Uh, that is sort of the headline of the uh, Swedish chairpersonship. Um, what has happened to the OSC? Why is it necessary to remind us all that we need to go back to basics, that we need to focus on the fundamentals. Is it because we, we, we forgot about those fundamentals or is it because the OSE is focused on, on other things? Why do you see this need to sort of remind us that there is a, a basic uh, core element to the OSE that we need to, uh, to, uh, to revisit? Well, thank you, Fleming, for that uh, question. I think there are two main factors that uh, that um, for us uh, that convinced us that this was indeed what was needed right now. And I think the first of them is uh, an increased geopolitical tension uh, in our OSE region. And I tried to describe it a little bit in my in my introduction. But I think we all know <laughs> that over the last 15 or so years. There has been more, uh, more threats to the European security order than what was the uh, um, occasion before or what was the, the case before. So that's one element. And I think uh, as much as we want to remind ourselves of, of the, 
going back to basics, we also need to, to see clearly that we have different opinions on some of these uh, core elements of the OSC's um, commitments and principles. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing, of course, being what I also tried to describe is the fact that after many years of democratic advancement and development, we do see in some corners of the OSC region that there is a democratic backsliding. Uh, mm -hmm. And that also puts strains on, on those uh, core commitments and principles. Uh, and that's uh, something we need to remind ourselves there. Okay. Perhaps I see more, uh, I'm more hopeful that we, by, by reminding ourselves, by being open and transparent and uh, by, by using the instrument that the OSC has in mm -hmm. order to support it, its uh, participating states that we can actually make progress. And I mm -hmm. see a lot of witness of that uh, from not least from the field missions. And I'm sure Ambassador Irila will, will talk more about that. But I think there we have an instrument that we should really support uh, along with the uh, autonomous institutions. Both of them have extremely important mandates uh, and, and tasks to help the participating states. Right, thank you. We have a question concerning gender equality in Africa. And uh, this is not an area uh, continent covered by the OC. So let me, let me rephrase uh, perhaps the question. Uh, it, it, it pertains to gender equality in societies that are more traditional. So how do you see your gender agenda uh, unfolding in, in, in a relatively wide, large area, of course, uh, where we also have different societies, different norms. What is it that, that you intend to do and, and, and what is the particular role of Sweden in this? Thank you. And that's a very pertinent question. I think it was something we were reminded of also last week as we traveled to Central Asia, where there is indeed uh, some more challenging environments in terms of gender equality. Uh, but as I said, I mean, gender is an issue where we firmly believe it's not something we do as a sort of a, a token uh, or something. It's something we believe uh, in. And there's ample research to show that uh, including women in, in, the, in the economic life and in the political life will indeed bring about um, progress to a society. And so I think what this chair in office is doing is trying to find the right context in which to address this in the specific uh, countries that she travels to in order to meet those leaders where they are and where their ch security challenges lie. I think this was also apparent from, and there was a lot of agreement on this. We, As I said, we discussed in Central Asia, I come back now with my <laughs> head full of Central Asia, but it is an interesting region. Uh, and uh, I think we're discussing Afghanistan, that is one of the most apparent uh, countries, I think, in the world where we have seen you know, a lot of wins last 15, 20 years uh, for women uh, from a very low uh, position, of course, uh, and where I think uh, the countries in Central Asia agree that uh, the women, peace and security agenda must be also at the forefront when, when uh, discussing stability and security in Afghanistan. So I think we need to see those uh, contexts uh, in which this uh, becomes relevant and where our interlocutors understand the meaning and, and the, the value mm -hmm. of, of gender equality. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty, <laughs> pretty optimistic. Okay, great. We have another question. This is from Beade. And she asked uh, in, in sort of in relation to, to uh, what was just discussed, uh, Beade is curious about the women, peace and security agenda. And what do you think is the, is the greatest single obstacle to the full implementation of this agenda as you look across this, uh, this vast area? Oh, well, even if I tried to, to end my, the last intervention on a positive note, I, I shouldn't uh, shy away from the fact that uh, last year in, in, um, in Tirana, when there was the Ministerial Council of the OSC, uh, two decisions were blocked by different participating states uh, that, that pertained to gender and women peace and security. And there is no consensus, uh, let's be honest, on that uh, particular 
uh, on the role of that uh, UN security resolution in the OSC context, which to us is a bit surprising because it is a UN Security Council resolution that we rest upon, 1325. Uh, and so uh, we will continue working on it, but but there are there are different, uh, <laughs> and I won't disclose anything more than that. But I think mm -hmm. it's 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 apparent from 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 the discourse today that uh, uh, new <laughs> obstacles have been raised, uh, and new countries have started raising concerns regarding this agenda. So there is a lot to work on, really, mm -hmm. and uh, through dialogue. I think uh, a lot of it has to be done through dialogue. Mm -hmm. Right. Great. Thank you. We continue uh, along the same line. Ufe has a question and he's curious about uh, the work of the OSCE uh, together with other organizations such as the European Union, for instance, you mentioned NATO and, and the Council of Europe. How do you see the role of the OSCE and, and your specific task right now and, and your sort of the, the possibilities for you to also to engage other organizations to achieve more on this important agenda? Well, I think that is also something that we try to prioritize. I, I told you about the interaction that the uh, CIO has had with the UN mm -hmm. Security General, uh, sorry, the Secretary General mm -hmm. uh, and the UN Security Council, where she has appeared twice, actually, both in introducing our priorities, but also uh, in a meeting that was held in the Security Council on Monday, uh, where there was a discussion on regional security organizations. So there was also ASEAN and uh, the League of Arab States uh, and others represented in that meeting. So this is something where we think uh, the OSC being the largest regional uh, security organization uh, that we can actually <laughs> um, we, can, we can actually be proud of ourselves. Uh, the OSC has a lot to, to speak for, um, both in terms of or working in the three dimensions. And I would specifically mention perhaps, I mean, apart from the third dimension where we're doing a lot of important work, I think also what we're doing on confidence and security building measures has a lot to offer to other regions uh, in terms of transparency and confidence building and, 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 and decreasing tension. So I think this is something that we want to work with and where the uh, CIO Linda has, um, has, has engaged in dialogue and also in other parts of the world and trying to explain them to offer um, good uh, advice, uh, mm -hmm. if you would, uh, from the OSC. Mm -hmm. Let me ask a question perhaps uh, concerning some of the, uh, the conflicts that you mentioned. Uh, it's uh, already been a busy year, uh, we're only in April, a uh, number of challenges uh, sort of presented themselves and you mentioned a few of them and you, you look at, you mentioned uh, conflict in, in, in and around Ukraine, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, Moldova, um, and you also mentioned the possibility in Georgia even of course also, and you mentioned the possibility also of offering the good offices of, uh, of Stockholm. What should we expect? What, what is realistic for you to embrace? Uh, um, and, and do you see any traction in, in some of this, that, uh, some of these conflicts that you may uh, sort of help uh, facilitate and promote um, uh, during this time? Thank you. Well, um, I think I mentioned that Moldova is perhaps the conflict, but I think many chairs before us have also thought that Moldova was the lowest hanging fruit because Indeed, there we are discuss discussing in the five plus two format building on the Berlin uh, package that was uh, negotiated uh, some years ago. Um, there are a number of, of concrete issues where we think that if the parties can only show a little bit more of political will, and, uh -huh. and I think also now we are seeing a situation in Moldova where there are internal uh, political tensions that need to be sorted out. We have mm -hmm. good hopes that the Moldovans will be able to sort things out. But once that's done, I think there's there is uh, you know there could be really be some momentum in that mm -hmm. uh, in that process. And there, I, I mean, if if that is indeed the case, we stand ready to to welcome the parties to 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 Stockholm in order to have a more of a high level discussion on that. Um, when it comes to Ukraine, I wouldn't say that we are <laughs> optimistic. I think 
it's just something that we have very high on the agenda and where the CIO personally is very engaged. And, and I know that the rest of the OSC is also mm -hmm. there, there. We have important instruments applied in the Ukraine conflicts, uh, the SMM, of course, and sure. the trilateral contact group where the special representative of the CIO, Mrs. Heidi Grau, is indeed chairing these, uh, these negotiations. A lot of uh, important <laughs> issues are being discussed there. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, constantly, and and we are trying to support that discussion mm -hmm. and trying to to what we can do to do what we can in order to uh, lower human suffering and try sure. to bring about uh, more freedom of movement, both both for the populations on both sides of the contact line, but also for the special monitoring mis mission. Mm -hmm trying to consolidate the ceasefire, which is under under threat. I mean, there is a number of violations to the ceasefire and that's, um, that's constantly <laughs> evolving and back yeah. and forth. But so even if I'm not, I wouldn't say that I'm optimistic that we will really, really achieve a major breakthrough in the Ukraine conflict. I'm, I'm afraid it's, uh, we see that positions are a bit locked, but we, definitely will not give up on 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 uh, trying to relieve the humanitarian uh, suffering in that conflict so so that will be our focus great before we let you go i know you have to attend another meeting uh, let me just uh, just quickly squeeze in a final question it, it concerns ukraine it concerns very specific rumors now on uh, as a follow up to the minsk agreements uh, people are now mentioning the possibility of a Stockholm process. Uh, so can you reveal anything? Is it possible that that we will see a Stockholm agreement uh, maybe to replace the Minsk II agreement? Uh, is this in the cards? Is this something that you are actively undertaking now? Uh, I, I wasn't aware of such rumors actually. Oh. I think I think it's, I, I mean, I've heard other, there are always rumors in yes. swing. But what I want to say, uh, and I want to be very clear on that, is that we expect the full implementation of the Minsk agreements, uh, both by Russia and Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of very fundamental things in the Minsk agreements, such as Ukraine regaining control of its state border, mm -hmm. uh, and that are key uh, to this conflict being solved. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, let's all focus on on having the full implementation of the Minsk agreements. I think that would already be something <laughs> very good. Let's all, let's all hope for that. Uh, Ambassador Petroliaka, thank you for your time. Uh, it was a great pleasure to have you here. I wish you success uh, during this uh, chairpersonship. As we just learned, it's a very important agenda. It concerns all of us. And I really hope that you uh, will have uh, lots of success as you uh, continue your important work uh, with the implementation of this. So thank you for your time and uh, good luck. Thank you for having me, and I wish you fruitful discussions. Thanks. With that, we uh, will continue. Uh, we will now uh, sort of move along similar lines. We'll look at conflicts. We'll go to the uh, Conflict Prevention Center, which is part of the uh, OSCE. And uh, we have with us today Ambassador Tula Uyula, who is director of the Conflict Prevention Center, the CPC, to uh, enlighten us um, about the work of the CPC and perhaps also to discuss some of the conflicts that, uh, that we just learned about and, and conflicts, of course, which are also high on the uh, Swedish uh, chairpersonship agenda. So with that, Ambassador, uh, welcome. Apologies, uh, I wanted to share um, my screen, but it seems to me that I can either do that or see what I'm doing here. So let me try. Can you um, can you help me uh, share the screen now? Can you give me the permission, please? Okay. Okay, and we are at the wrong slide. I think that, um, apologies for this, it's, uh, okay, there we go. All right, so let me first of all really thank uh, the Danish Institute for International Studies for inviting me to speak. 
about, um, in particular, the work of the OSC Conflict Prevention Center, the CPC, as we call it, as well as the OSC's role in the wider conflict and, and security context. Now, I will be repeating maybe some of what, uh, what uh, the head of the Swedish task force already said, uh, Petra Lerke, but still, I would say, just start with saying that in today's world, obviously, we're facing a complex web of diverse um, and overlapping security challenges that hamper peaceful and sustainable development around the globe, and of course, also including in the OSC area. And, and when I speak of the OSC area, just to remind, I'm, I do mean the 57 participating states of the organization, um, as well as our Asian and Mediterranean partners for cooperation. So it's quite a wide area. And, and we live today in a highly dynamic and increasingly uncertain geopolitical environment. Violent crises are more common. The risk of armed conflict has, has increased with the uncertainties. And, and there are competitive narratives a lack of trust and an erosion of cooperative approaches. And these all undermine the OSC's role as a multilateral platform for conflict prevention and crisis management. And of course, as with so many other disruptions that it has caused to us in the past year, the COVID-19 crisis has created further stresses, um, increasing risks of tension and instability, as well as escalation of uh, conflicts. And no country has been immune from the pandemic, as we know, but um, in conflict settings, we've seen its adverse effects as well. So in this world uh, that we're living in currently, what is needed is a diverse set of tools, um, but also the flexibility to adapt them to evolving situations. And at the OSC, I would say we have those, both a comprehensive set of tools and, and also the flexibility to use them. On the other hand, we are also facing constraints because of the nature of the OSC, and um, it's a very particular type of international organization. Uh, as was already mentioned, uh, the decision making is based on the principle of consensus, and, and so the polarized political climate among our participating states often limits our possibilities to address uh, existing and emerging conflicts. However, uh, I would like to underline that indeed it is the world's largest regional security organization. And as such, the OSC is the primary instrument for early warning conflict prevention, crisis management, as well as post-conflict rehabilitation and peace building. Uh, now, let me outline some of the opportunities and challenges that uh, the OSC is confronted with in our daily work. And I'll give you a, uh, a brief introduction to the most important uh, functions of the Conflict Prevention Center, the CPC. Um, that was established in uh, 1990 by the Charter of Paris for a New Europe. And the CPC is part of the OSC Secretariat here in Vienna, where I am. Uh, one of the uh, key roles that we have is to support the OSC chair this year, Sweden, and next year it'll be Poland, taking over the chairpersonship um, in facilitating political dialogue among our 57 participating states. And we work to build confidence and security across the OSC area in a, in a variety of ways. Uh, we also provide advice to the chair and across the organization on how to apply the tools that we have to address uh, the different phases of, of uh, the conflict cycle. Transparency of um, military activities uh, among the participating states is, is very important for the prevention of conflict or uh, for making sure that a potential or budding conflict uh, situation can be de-escalated. And to this end, uh, we support the OSC's decision-making body that deals with political military aspects of security. That's the Forum of, for Security Cooperation or FSC. And uh, as the FSC also has a rotating system um, of participating states taking on the chairpersonship. Um, so we offer the institutional memory and knowledge to each chair uh, in order to support them as they're taking forward dialogue on a variety of important issues related to, um, for example, countering the proliferation of small arms and light weapons. And we also have a system that enables the participating states uh, to securely exchange military information for verification and compliance purposes. And, and uh, we have other ways as well, um, as well as projects also to assist cooperation on hard security matters. 
And an important tool for the participating states to build confidence and security um, that is based on mutual military transparency is the Vienna document, which was mentioned already and which was adopted in 1990. It has since gone um, a couple of updates, actually. And this, uh, of course, Vienna document has been in the news lately in relation to the situation around Ukraine. But, in, uh, but I would say that many of the mechanisms that it includes are used regularly as a form of confidence and security building. Um, there are inspection and evaluation visits uh, to military activities and installations on short notice between all participating states, uh, amounting to about 150 such events per year, just to give you an example. Now, one of the major challenges that we face as an organization um, are the different views of the participating states on how to actually safeguard security in the OSC area. For example, some participating states see their security best preserved through membership in NATO or the EU, while others perceive the expansion of uh, this kind of alliances as a threat to their own security. And in this environment, it's difficult to find a common denominator on uh, which further agreements can be built, especially when it comes to arms control or military transparency. Um, something that's important, very important actually to understand is, is the cross dimensionality of the approach that we take to conflict prevention and resolution. And, and here I mean that in order to prevent uh, conflicts in the first place, but also to support their resolution uh, and to build sustainable peace after a crisis. Um, the OSCE's three dimensions are equally important. And um, the CPC has been empowered, in fact, to use um, what we call a conflict cycle toolbox uh, to provide various forms of assistance to that end. In 2011, uh, the OSC Ministerial Council in Vilnius adopted a decision on uh, elements of the conflict cycle. Um, they assigned to the CPC a number of specific uh, responsibilities in that, and these are related, for example, uh, to creating a more systematic and structured approach uh, to collecting, analyzing, and communicating early warning signals, which would be needed to prepare the ground for preventive action and early response in case of an emerging conflict. Uh, being able to have early warning is, of course, critical for being able to engage in early action and, and a crisis response. And uh, while it can be sensitive when such a warning is considered, I have to emphasize that it is not meant to, you know, as an exercise in naming and shaming. Rather, it is a crucial prerequisite for um, effective conflict prevention. Situational awareness and early warning are needed so that the OSC can engage in preventive, um, in a preventive manner when uh, tensions arise or crisis emerge. Um, uh, regrettably, political considerations and understandable but unfortunate uh, sensitivities among participating states can hinder uh, the OSC from doing what it is mandated to do, uh, which is uh, working to ensure sustainable peace and security in the face of growing tensions and instability. And when it comes to early warning, um, the CPC's job is uh, to provide analysis to the Secretary General and to the OSC Chair, and also to serve as a focal point of the, of the entire organization for early warning. Uh, we also support our field operations in building their capacities in, in early warning and conflict analysis. And let me now mention some specifics that are important for uh, conflict prevention in particular, but also for keeping conflicts from escalating, as well as in post-conflict environments for societies uh, to return to sustainable and inclusive peace. Um, one thing is uh, to highlight is our longstanding and distinguished history of promoting inter and uh, intra-community uh, dialogue. This uh, is done both through our work in the CPC and in our uh, field operations and in the uh, OSC institutions. Another important aspect of um, the work that we do, and, and this is in particular in our field operations actually, is the institution and capacity building that is related to democratization, the rule of law, human rights, environmental governance, the protection of minority rights, and, and civil society development. Uh, these are essential so that we can, in, in line with the comprehensive nature of conflict and, and therefore, of course, of conflict prevention, 
uh, to support dialogue and confidence building. And well, the OSC being uh, an organization that is based on the participating states having agreed by consensus on a host of commitments and principles, uh, our job is to support them in implementing these commitments and to help them address the root causes of conflict and instability. And uh, this helps to build sustainable peace in places that have experienced violent conflict in the past. And uh, our comprehensive approach to security is really, I think, key to ensuring stable political, economic, and societal development. And, uh, and also to remind that in this, uh, we are also supporting the implementation of the UN Sustainable Peace Agenda and the fulfillment of the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, in particular SDG uh, 16, which is related to just peaceful and inclusive societies. And I already mentioned our field operations. Uh, there are 16 of them. And they provide the OSC with a strong comparative advantage to, um, or, or rather in comparison to other international and regional actors. I, I myself have concrete evidence of the work that they do uh, because I had the privilege uh, to serve as head of mission in Dushanbe a couple of uh, years ago. And I would argue that in fact, while the meetings in Vienna among participating states delegations are important, uh, the OSC's concrete engagement really happens on the ground primarily. Uh, more than 80% of our staff are deployed in the field in Central Asia, in uh, Southeastern Europe, Eastern Europe, and the South uh, Caucasus. And at the CPC, we are the primary link uh, between the field operations and the rest of the OSC. You can see in the map where they are. Uh, we keep uh, the participating states informed of the work of the field missions and in turn they or we keep rather uh, them up on, to date about the political discussions that are going on in Vienna. And in this way we're ensuring that the policy guidance from here is, is translated into programs and projects on the ground. And there's quite a variety to the field operations and some of them are quite large. I mean, the biggest example really being the special uh, monitoring mission to Ukraine, which has about 1,300 mission members. Others are small, like the OSC observer mission at the Russian checkpoints Gukovo and Donetsk, which is uh, situated on the Ukrainian border and has only about 20 staff. And you will see them on the map. Uh, some of the field operations have strong political mandates and they contribute to the implementation of uh, international peace agreements. Uh, for example, the mission to Bosnia and Herzegovina contributes to the implementation of the 1995 Dayton Peace Agreement. The mission to Skopje assists in the implementation, uh, implement, uh, I can't speak, implementing uh, the 2001 Ohrid Framework Agreement. And, and the work of our six field operations in Southeastern Europe actually exemplifies also the need for close cooperation with other international actors on the ground. Um, but also more generally, effective coordination and communication with other international actors in the field is important uh, to the success of our engagement there. And it helps us to achieve synergies and to avoid du duplication of efforts. So for example, um, as the countries of Southeastern Europe are pursuing EU memberships, their need to align to the EU's commitments and principles and the commitments that they've made to the OSCE or in the OSCE rather, mean that we have a unique opportunity to deepen the OSCE-EU partnership and to maximize the benefits of our respective engagement in the region. And uh, I also have to say we have excellent cooperation with UN agencies as well as other international actors um, in the field anywhere where we work. Now, uh, Continuing on the field operations, uh, not all of the, them have political mandates. So field operations in Central Asia, and this is a region that I know well, uh, they're mainly focused on implementing programs and projects that reflect the host country priorities. And we're very proud um, of the Border Management Staff College, for example, in Dushanbe, uh, which educates border security and management officials. Um, as it brings together officials from across the OSC region, as well as partners for cooperation, including uh, border and security officials from neighboring Afghanistan as well, the courses of the BMSC also promote greater cooperation among them. And I cannot but note that the picture on the screen uh, shows me uh, sitting in the front row um, on a project on, on uh, mine action, on humanitarian demining. So this is from my time in Dushanbe. Um, but let me also mention the OSC Academy in Bishkek, 
which promotes uh, regional cooperation, uh, conflict prevention and good governance in Central Asia. Uh, it reaches young Central Asians and brings them together to study these important topics. I, I think it's just an excellent uh, example again. Now, most of the field operations implement activities that are aimed at uh, supporting the host countries, as I said, really with uh, addressing root causes of, of tensions and instability. And, and they're working together on this uh, with the national authorities and uh, civil society in a variety of ways. And again, it's important to recall that we're always talking of comprehensive security and the three dimensions of security. So the work can really involve, for example, supporting water management or education reform, uh, combating radicalization, violent extremism, or trafficking in human beings, or working to end um, or uh, hate speech uh, and hate crimes. It's quite a wide agenda, uh, depending always on the individual mandate of, of, of the mission, of the particular mission. The um, OSC also has a, a long history of supporting the participating states in, in strengthening their security sector institutions. And security sector governance and reform uh, is always a nationally owned process, but, but the CPC and the field operations are providing support where asked. And, I would say that in fact demand driven support that meets needs meets the needs of the people on the ground is really at the heart of the work of our field operations. Um, which is really why um, our mandate uh, for conflict prevention and peaceful conflict resolution is very much based on local approaches and local ownership. And if we want to be successful in uh, building sustainable peace and security. Um, you know, we need a vision of peace that is broadly shared and that is supported by local efforts. And this is why we work not only with government actors, but also very importantly with civil society organizations and at the local level in general. Because um, when considering actual um, emerging or ongoing conflict or crisis situations, the, the promotion of local peace infrastructures is, is really important. And by that, I mean national or local institutions that are involved in mediation and dispute settlement or community-based early warning networks uh, and conflict prevention initiatives. It's, it's really important to work towards broad participation in seeking to find solutions to a conflict. And this, of course, means also including civil society women's peace initiatives also to reflect the concerns of the broader society. Um, unfortunately, our best efforts are not always enough to resolve the conflict or to stop a crisis from escalating into violence. Um, this was obviously the case in the summer of 2014 when the security situation in eastern Ukraine turned from tense to hostile and, and in fact our civilian monitors then found themselves in the middle of a de facto war zone. And there was already talk about the SMM, the special monitoring mission to Ukraine. They have been operating uh, in a high risk and complex uh, security environment ever since. Um, our monitors continue to face significant risks and challenges on a daily basis. The use of sophisticated technological monitoring assets, however, helps to make the work of the monitors on the ground safer and more secure. Um, in fact, the SMM was the first uh, OSC field operation to employ uh, advanced camera systems, satellite imagery, and various types of drones to provide for safety of the monitors and to help the mission to fulfill its monitoring and reporting mandate. You will see some pictures here of, uh, of that work. And um, with technology, they're able to expand and reach, um, or rather expand the reach of the ground patrols, uh, in particular um, as restrictions on access um, and uh, to freedom of movement remain a challenge, including in the areas close to, close to the Russian border. And they're also better able to fulfill additional tasks stemming from the Minsk agreements, uh, such as ceasefire monitoring and verifying uh, the withdrawal of heavy weapons. And it's important to note that the SMM is not only mandated to monitor and report on the security situation throughout Ukraine, but they're also there to diffuse tensions and to facilitate dialogue wherever possible. Uh, they work uh, to ease the disastrous humanitarian consequences of the conflict by brokering localized ceasefires for the repair of critical infrastructure, uh, such as uh, power and water supplies. And, and really so, I think the important thing here is to point out that in this way, the OSC's work really directly supports the people on the ground. And well, female monitoring officers 
and I really want to highlight this, I mean, they make a critical contribution to the SMM's work, but unfortunately, there are too few of them. Uh, currently, only about 20% of the SMM's monitoring office officers are actually women, uh, and we would be needing many more. We're constantly reminding the participating states to nominate more women as candidates for these essential positions. Um, the SMM civilian nature and, and its use of state-of-the-art monitoring technology um, and its ability to respond flexibly to the changing situation on the ground really all make it uh, a unique example of uh, a modern peace operation and an effective crisis management tool. Um, unfortunately, one that remains uh, continues to remain all too necessary. Um, overall, as I think we all know from reading the news lately, the political climate around the security situation in eastern Ukraine um, remains very tense and we're keeping a close eye on the developments from an early warning perspective. Um, I do remain hopeful though that these tensions will not escalate further and instead uh, they would allow us to keep our full attention on, on facilitating a diplomatic resolution to the crisis in and around Ukraine that, uh, that uh, the uh, head of the task force, Petra Alker, was al already talking about, and she mentioned the TCG, the Trilateral Contact Group in Minsk, um, and the work that that is doing. So um, I'm getting to the end, but a little more um, uh, on the, uh, in fact, the, the uh, conflict resolution, because really contributing uh, to the peaceful resolution of conflicts uh, through mediation and dialogue facilitation is really at the heart of the OSCE's mandate. And in addition to the TCG, um, as was already mentioned, there is the Transnistrian settlement process, which is aiming uh, at the comprehensive, peaceful and lasting political settlement of that conflict. In the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict context, the Minsk group and its co-chairs, as well as the personal representative of the chair. And following the August 2008 war in Georgia, there's the Geneva International Discussions. And an important role in the conflict resolution processes is played by these special representatives of the OSC person, uh, chairperson in office, as well as in the case of Transnistria, also the OSC mission to Moldova, which is on the ground. In the GID, the Geneva International Discussions, the special representative of the uh, chairperson in office for the South Caucasus co-chairs these uh, GID, uh, the, the, the process alongside her counterparts from the UN and the EU, and, and speaking of Georgia, where also the CPC is actually co-facilitating meetings of this so-called Incident Prevention and Response Mechanism, or IPRM, uh, in Ergneti, um, which is important because it addresses uh, security and humanitarian matters that are affecting the daily life of people in South Ossetia. Um, the full potential of our support is hindered, hindered in Georgia by the lack of a field presence, and um, the OSC mission to Georgia was closed in 2009, due to a lack of consensus among participating states. And, and here, in fact, you have to realize that the mandates of the OSC field operations must be agreed by all participating states. And this holds true for the existing ones, but also in case uh, there would be a wish by some participating state uh, to establish a new one. And as our mandate and work is based on the principle of consensus by all the participating states, regrettably, that also means that at times, excessive politicization of security and humanitarian issues hampers uh, constructive engagement. And this often has a direct impact on conflict affected populations. But uh, while our capacities to untangle the Gordian knot of political stalemate might be limited, um, mediation capacities are uh, one solution that we uh, are making use of. In fact, we have a mediation support team, which is, I would say, one of our strongest assets, uh, helping to strengthen uh, the OSCE's capacities for peaceful conflict resolution. And this is both on the ground and, and at the strategic level. And um, inclusivity in conflict resolution processes, of course, strengthens the legitimacy of such processes. And, and, and I, I do need to mention the need for gender sensitive approaches, uh, in particular those that ensure the inclusion of women in peace processes. Um, in fact, here I would just recommend uh, for you to read our toolkit on inclusion on women and effective peace processes. Uh, you can find a link to that in the OSD web pages. And finally to say that, um, I mean, 
indeed on the on the gender side i mean we recognize that more needs to be done to ensure that women are meaningfully included in every phase of the conflict cycle and of course as was already clear uh from the previous speaker uh, this is a key priority of the swedish OEC chair and we're working closely with the swedish delegation here in vienna uh, to improve gender mainstreaming of our conflict cycle tools so um coming to the end of my presentation let me just wrap up by really saying summarizing that the OSC is a political organization with a diverse toolbox and a comprehensive approach to security. And it is uniquely positioned to foster community level, regional or state to state dialogue on various issues and at different levels in the field or among the participating states here in Vienna. And, um, and I think really uh, in today's uh, environment, the OSC's role as a regional arrangement under chapter eight of the UN charter is really more relevant than ever. And um, the conflict uh, prevention center plays a key role. I'm proud to say that we have an excellent team working on conflict prevention and peace building. But of course, um, you know, our work depends also on not only adequate resources, which is always a question, but also political support uh, to these efforts. Uh, so I would just say in the end that um, what I always hope for is that the participating states summon the political will to allow us to make full use of the mandate that they have given to us uh, by consensus. And I will end here. I hope I have been able to provide you with some inter interesting and practical insights into the work of the OSC and in particular the department that I'm heading, which is the Conflict Prevention Center. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for this, uh, Ambassador Yula. Uh, great overview of uh, the work that you do, and and of course an introduction also to some of this uh, very important uh, work of the OSCE in general. Um, let me uh, start by asking like a very practical question. Now you mentioned a number of existing conflicts, and and unfortunately, of course, we all familiar with those. We know how difficult they are, and and how sort of. Uh, really deep-rooted some of these conflicts are. Let's imagine, and hopefully it doesn't, it doesn't happen, but you, you see in your early warning tension arising somewhere. What are the tools that you have available? How, do you, how does the center approach this? How, how, can, you, how can you get involved in a, in, a, in a situation of tension between two or more states, perhaps? Well, I mean, the, what are the tools available? I, I would say that the, it's one of those questions where one has to say it depends. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, now uh, in the in the case of this recent uh, situation with Ukraine, maybe to take that as an example, um, we have in fact been working hard uh, to examine constantly in order for us to uh, then give advice to the chair, to the Swedish chair, and, and and also to the secretary general on what exactly are the tools that can be can be used. And uh, in this case, uh, we have. Um, of course, I mean, let's say Ukraine made use of, because it is actually many times also up to the participating states to make use of the tools rather than us directly. Uh, so uh, Ukraine made use of, of the Vienna document, mm -hmm. the chapter three and so forth. There are, you know, so there are um, articles in the Vienna document that the participating state that has concerns can make use of by invoking uh, these certain, uh, you know, um, and chapters to uh, demand, you know, to to wish for, you know, wish for consultations and so forth and so on. So we progressed uh, on this front um, with uh, then, um, of course, us in an advisory role uh, to the chair. And so the Swedish chair then, uh, on the request from Ukraine, uh, called first for consultations between uh, the two countries concerned, and then called for uh, what is called a uh, special PCFSC, so special permanent council, and forum for uh, cooperation. Um, for security cooperation together uh, to have a meeting. Uh, so this is one, one way of going. And the Vienna document includes other uh, opportunities that the participating states can make uh, use of. What we are there then doing is uh, facilitating the information exchange and the use of those mechanisms. Um, the SMM on the ground uh, has a mandate in Ukraine and, and within the limitations of their uh, geographic reach, uh, they are obviously uh, monitoring the situation and providing uh, situational updates as well as, 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 as uh, being there to facilitate whatever uh, they can, but uh, of course, as I said, within their geographic reach. Um, then uh, 
there was the issue of the uh, Sea of uh, Azov and the Black Sea. Well, I mean, that then we start looking into, uh, or rather, uh, there is uh, the issue of of the uh, the states that are uh, you know the literal states and 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 uh, their uh, bilateral or regional arrangements and so it becomes complicated. It's not it's not an easy question of just having one solution to everything. Um, in the uh, in Transnistria, of course, it's all about um, uh, confidence building measures very much that our mission to Moldova does, um, uh, supporting uh, facilitation of contacts and and supporting uh, this special representative of the chair who works on the actual conflict, you know, the, the so-called uh, 5 plus 2 format, and, um, and then uh, supporting, um, let's say, bringing the conflict sides together, basically trying to facilitate contacts, same kind of thing that is being done in the Geneva international discussion. So there is no one solution fits all. We, we have this conflict prevention toolbox where, as I mentioned earlier, there's the early warning. Uh, there, I have to say that while we have very comprehensive follow-up of, of, um, uh, of uh, let's say, um, news, uh, news feeds and so forth, but I mean, we rely on open source information. Uh, we do not have uh, any kind of special technologies to figure out what's going on in the background if somebody doesn't tell us, but open source information is already in itself quite useful. We have a 24-7 monitoring uh, of that. Uh, and then again, that that helps us as well as, of course, our missions on the ground where we have them to then then um, you know alert, uh, which then can lead to early action where it is. Uh, I mean, we play a supportive role, I would say, rather than active, but of course, also ready to um, jump in and go and travel if there is a need to go and see something somewhere. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm sorry about the confusing answer, but no, that's, but that's it's all uh, very that's, confusing. Uh, that's, uh, that's the complex reality of it, and uh, and it's it's good to know, of course, that that you do have before you a wide variety of tools that can be used in 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 very different uh, settings. So, um, I noticed one thing during your presentation: a couple of of, of sort of terms, um, formulations that stand out. You talked about excessive uh, politicization. Now, if we look at the conflicts that we've discussed now previously as well, there's a list of conflicts. We know these conflicts, they are quite protracted. Some of them may be quite difficult to solve. We know this also, we understand and realize that this is the case. Do you find that it has become more complicated perhaps because of, of uh, politicization? Now you talked about excessive politicization. Do you find that the OCE and the work that you do now has a, has a, a different sort of flavor to it because of, of, of the way certain participating states may see uh, see this work. Well, I think there's two ways of looking at this. The, the one unfortunate thing is that that has been quite obvious is that that the pandemic situation, which mm -hmm. has forced us out of face-to-face uh, -face, uh, contacts, has actually uh, uh, brought this more um, just just sort of sharper, let's say, dialogue, and and it's I would even not talk about dialogue anymore. I mean, the problem is uh, we all know it. You know, you're on Zoom, you make your st statement, you close your camera off, and 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 uh, that is really not helpful, and that is in particular not helpful when one is talking of of mediation and and trying to resolve conflicts. So this has quite clearly uh, exacerbated the 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 uh, the the uh, sort of the negative you know, tone of, of, of discussions and of, uh, and that has been very unfortunate. And I'm sure that it'll actually take some time to get out of that kind of mental mode once we, hopefully one of these days return back to more normal. Uh, the other thing is that unfortunately, uh, uh, the, um, the there is a certain, uh, of course, uh, also, uh, tendency uh and and i think in some ways this is very understandable but it's also unfortunate in an organization such as the osce which is uh based on on this political consensus idea uh, that uh, that some participating states uh because of of course their own uh interests but they they tend to then politicize uh, you know uh, the unrelated issues uh in order to try to drive their own agenda and and as i go back to the fact that when you have a consensus-based organization 
uh, right now um, we still don't have our budget for this year. Obviously, we are still operating, but I mean, uh, there has not been an agreement on on the unified budget for for 2021 because of because of the fact that there is no consensus on it yet. So so there is this uh, element of it which we struggle with. At the same time, when there is consensus on something, it's it, it's a strict. All right, thank you for this. Before we before we end this section, I need to ask you, of course, about Ukraine. And I'm sure that it's a it's a major concern for you also in your daily work right now. Can you say a few words about the present situation, how you are involved and how how do you do you see the present uh, sort of uh, tension uh, in and around uh, the, the eastern part of the country? Yeah, you are asking me a question that I will very diplomatically uh, go around because uh, since we have a supporting role i think we need to we need to stay very careful in not not providing our own um uh, sort of let's say uh, in that sense analysis or 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 um, anything but no i think uh, obviously it's it's a very sit serious situation uh when uh, there are uh concerns uh from 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 one side um that uh, that should be addressed. I mean, this is clear. So I think what I'm most worried about is the potential for the escalation mm -hmm. of the situation um, if uh, there the the transparency that is needed, and that could be uh, accomplished through, for example, the Vienna uh, document mechanisms, is not uh, is not made use of. So so I think right now it's a question of really encouraging. Uh, for uh, you know transparency um, in the name of confidence and security building, and 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 that's what that's that's what is needed. Um, negative rhetoric is not going to get us anywhere. Uh, if we really, I think I echo here Peter Larke, who said that it would be best to be able to return to the diplomatic table uh, in the in the TCG to continue discussions. But um, but I, I am afraid of, of course. There is always the danger of escalation when the rhetoric is at the level that it is now. Mm -hmm. All right. With this, thank you very much, Ambassador Tula uh, Viola. And uh, thank you for giving us this uh, insight into the work that you do, of course, the work of your colleagues uh, at the Conflict Prevention Center. I also wish you good luck uh, with the very important work that you do. And we all follow this, of course, on a daily basis. Uh, some people out there perhaps may not be aware of the uh, important role that you play in in trying to prevent and to settle conflicts but uh, but thank you very much for your time and thank you for your effort also right, thank you very much thank you and with this we will uh, go to the third and final section of uh, today's webinar we'll uh, turn to the international secretariat of the parliamentary assembly of the oc it's located here in copenhagen actually just around the corner more or less from from where I am, and uh, I'm pleased to welcome uh, the uh, Deputy Secretary General, uh, Gustavo Payares. Uh, welcome, Gustavo. Fleming, thank you very much, and good afternoon to you, and good afternoon to all the uh, to all the participants. Let me start by saying thank you uh, to the IIS for, inv for inviting uh, the OSC Parliamentary Assembly to participate in this distinguished panel with uh, uh, such important representatives of the organization as Ambassador Lerke and Ambassador Ujola. I think both of them have given you uh, the best background you can get of what the organization does for the pers perspective of the, uh, of the chairmanship and for the uh, perspective of the, uh, of the Conflict Prevention Center, which is, uh, if not the most important, the, uh, the most currently relevant on the, uh, on, on, on the issue of conflict prevention in the uh, in the uh, in the OSCE, I will just try to give you now the perspective and uh, information and uh, background on the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly. We are part of the OSCE family. We're an OSCE institution, but we're independent. We're not part of the uh, of the uh, of, of of the OSCE uh, institutions of the OSCE Secretariat, but we we function as an independent organization with within the OSCE, bringing together the parliamentarians. Of the uh, of the OSC, so let's say I mean um, if if we could compare to a let's say a governmental structure where let's say le the legislative branch of the uh, of the OSC and, and and we provide uh, parliamentary uh, parliamentary input. Uh, we are also born by the. Um, uh, by the uh, by the Paris Charter in 1990s when the. Uh, 
when the OSC Parliamentary Assembly was, was created. And it was actually 1993 that the Danish Parliament offered the Assembly once it was established to, to have its headquarters here in, uh, in Copenhagen. And we've been here since, since, since that time hosted by the, uh, by the Danish Folketing. We're most, most, most grateful to them because they, they really provide us with all the support with the headquarters and everything we, we have here in, um, in, in, in Copenhagen to operate and, and fulfill our, our mandate. And actually, I have to say, looking back in, in history, we have some common roots with, with you. If I understand correctly, you are the inheritor of what used to be called Duki. At uh, that time in the 90s, uh, we, we, shared, uh, we, we, we actually shared the premises in uh, uh, not very far away from here in Newtorf, where you had the, uh, the, I mean, the library of Dupi and our and our pre premises in the mid '90s were actually, were actually shared. So we have at, at least those uh, those common roots, and as you say, we're both uh, here here in Copenhagen, and we do have a proximity in in, in terms of uh, uh, physical, but also I think I think it's very important for us to have the opportunity to have contacts with institutions like you that are think tanks, academics, and that uh, give us also the opportunity to present to a wider audience of what we, we do in the assembly. Uh, with that said, I will just say uh, some in, in introductory words about, about the, the organization, a little bit what we're doing, and, and a, little, a little bit where we are going. Uh, I will also reflect on some of the, uh, of the previous interventions, because I think one of the main um, roles of the assembly is to enhance the visibility of the OSCE. As I say, we're part of the OSCE, but we're independent, meaning that we're not subject to two of the issues that I think that uh, uh, Ambassador Ujola just mentioned that I think very important. Uh, and one of them is the decision making, the consensus, which is both the, if you could say, the, uh, the strong, the strength, but also the weakness of the OSCE, because uh, recent consensus among uh, 57 participating states is not is not easy and sometimes that puts the organization in a difficult difficult situation. I will address this, this later. What, what does the OSC Parliamentary Assembly try to cont contribute to that? Our decision-making mechanisms are on a majority uh, base, so we have more flexibility sometimes to address issues, to be uh, kind of like sometimes an icebreaker in the, uh, in, the, in the organization, bringing issues to the... Uh, to the table. The, the Parliamentary Assembly brings together 323 members of Parliament from across the 57 nation OEC region. Uh, 56 of these parliament of these uh, participating states have parliaments. The Holy See does not. And these 56 participating states have a parliamentary delegation that participates in our in our meeting. We are a forum for parliamentary dialogue. We lead election observation mission. And we strengthen international cooperation to uphold commitments on political, security, economic, environmental, and human rights issues based on the OSC mandate. Um, the primary task is to, to, to facilitate this uh, interparliamentary dialogue and, uh, and, and to meet the, uh, the challenges of uh, democracy throughout, throughout the 57 participating states, in North America and, and Eurasia. Representing the national parliaments, members of the Parliamentary Assembly meet several times a year to debate a wide variety of issues relevant to the ultimate goal of all OSC efforts, human security for all in the OSC region. As elected representatives of the citizens of the OSC participating states, they play an important role in maintaining security and stability in the region. The parliamentarians debate, vote, and pass declarations and resolutions addressing issues concerning the promotion of human rights and fundamental freedoms, economic and environmental cooperation, and political military policies. One of the main roles of the, uh, of the Assembly, as I mentioned briefly, is enhancing the OEC visibility. When observing an election abroad or debating OEC policy in their own parliaments, sharing expertise with the foreign ministry or visiting a foreign government, parliamentarians raise the visibility and credibility of the OSCE. The selected officials enhance the profile of the OSCE, particularly in election observation. And this is the reason I know you have invited our, our Secretary General, uh, Roberto Montella, to be, to be the speaker today. Actually, he's in, in Tirana as we speak, because as uh, you may know, uh, Albania is having parliamentary elections this Sunday. We've been able, uh, within the, uh, the limitations that we have at the moment because of COVID, to deploy a, a mission, a parliamentary uh, 
um, delegation of observers that we have there observing the, uh, the elections in Albania. And this is, again, one of the main, main activities that we carry on in the, uh, in the assembly. The assembly also promotes the democracy. The, the elected status of our members give parliamentarians the independence and advantages that can at times open doors to dialogue in a way not available to appointed governmental representatives. When regional tensions flare, multilateral meetings of parliamentarians can foster communication and promote peaceful solutions. The Assembly regularly organizes topical seminars and conferences to support inter interparliamentary dialogue, review OSC commitments, and exchange views with top international experts. These events play special attention on issues such as minorities, migration, organized crime, and freedom of religion, as well as regional topics, including in the Caucasus, the Trans-Asian Parliamentary Dialogue, democratic development in the Mediterranean, environmental security in the Arctic, and economic problems in Southeast Europe. Going back to uh, election observation leadership, um, since 1993, the, uh, the OSC Parliamentary Assembly has led the OSC's election observation efforts, working very close together with the, uh, with the uh, OSC Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights in Warsaw, and, and maintaining the gold standard in the field of election observation with the OSC PA observes an election, the OSC chair in office appoints a senior member of the assembly as the special coordinator to lead the OSC short-term observers and present the statement of the observation mission on behalf of the whole organization. While the pandemic forced us to cancel the observation of several elections, including some important ones last year, such as Belarus and, uh, and Kyrgyzstan, which has, as you know, were followed by, by violence, we deployed a small team of observers to the elections in Montenegro last August, um, holding the briefings, of course, in a hybrid format, but the positive experience led us to organize last autumn with enhanced precautionary measures in place to fully fledged election observation missions to Georgia and the United States of America, with overall almost 100 parliamentarians involved. This past January, we deployed two missions simultaneously to Kyrgyzstan, and then with a limited time team with Kazakhstan. A few weeks ago, we were in Bulgaria, and right now, as we speak, we're in, uh, in Albania. While the smaller numbers, which also affect our other partners who could not deploy short-term observers, lead to substantially limit statistical capacity on election day proceedings, we still managed to address thoroughly the full electoral process. This is something that was appreciated by host authorities and proved yet again to the added value of the OSCE, especially against the backdrop of some other organizations not, not being able to observe at all. Normally, we work together with the, um, with the Council of Europe, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, with other, other organizations, including Par Parliamentary Assembly of NATO. Unfortunately, these organizations were not able to participate in any of these, uh, of these processes. The strong political contribution also showed our full impartiality, as clearly shown, for instance, in the critical US elections. These elections, remarkably one of the most widely covered activities in OECPA history, with our observation mentioning more than 300 related articles in the US and international press. I think this is very important to underline that our activities, our election monitoring uh, missions, take place in all participating states of the OSC. So if there are elections in the US, we will, we will send an observation mission. Elections here in Denmark, the Danish government is obliged to invite the OSC as part of the organization. Normally, we would decide whether or not to, to, to deploy a mission. But again, election observations, I think that is done widely in the, uh, in, in the OSC, affecting all, all, all participating states. Um, the OSC Parliamentary Assembly also, I will not go into detail in all our, uh, let's say, all uh, our organigram in terms of, of, of the different bodies, but. Uh, regarding special representatives, ad hoc committees, we also maintain a high level of, uh, of activity. Special representatives are parliamentarians from the participating states selected by our president to carry on a specific, a specific task. This past um, year, all special representatives have remained very engaged by participating in events, organizing meetings with relevant stakeholders and public messaging. 
the Secretary has organized two further web uh, dialogues this, this past autumn on, uh, from the Arctic to Global, the political role in addressing climate change, initiated by our special representative on Arctic issues, who is Toril Einsheim, a member of parliament from Norway, a topic on which we plan to convey more attention in the future. Also, uh, we had an event on uh, parla parliamentarians and journalists, partners against corruption, initiated by our special representative on, on fighting corruption, Irene Karalambidis, member of parliament from, from Cyprus. This was the first OECPA web dialogue open to active participation and contribution by the, uh, by the media. Uh, we have a very active special representative of gender issues, uh, uh, Heidi Fry, member of parliament from, from Canada, who has been very engaged in, uh, in, in project with the Office of Democratic Institution and Human Rights on uh, um, gender sensitive parliaments, which is a, is a survey that we've been working on. And um, we are now uh, supporting also three new regional special representatives, um, member of parliament from, from Germany, Daniela de Rieder on Eastern Europe, Mr. Didmir Bushati from, from Albania on South Caucasus, and Mr. Lopatka from Austria and Central, uh, special representative from Central Asia and Mongolia. We come now, we, uh, the, the, the OSI Parliamentary Assembly also has three general committees ref reflecting the three baskets of the, uh, of the Helsinki process. And these three general committees have kept also a high level of, of activity uh, in the related fields, protected conflicts, which you uh, had the opportunity to discuss now in detail with the director of the CPC, remain under the lens of the, uh, of the, of the General Committee on Political Affairs of Security, uh, together with the conflict in and around Ukraine. The second committee engaged in pandemic-related security developments by exploring the linkages between environmental degradation and public health including through a briefing with the Italian Society of Environmental Medicine, promoting science-based policy making and advocating for a more holistic approach to environmental security, whereby the protection of, of environment becomes the preconditions to effectively address both the public and the planet's health crisis. The third committee has been extremely active in addressing the impact of COVID on democracy and human rights and the worrying and widespread deterioration of fundamental freedoms across the OSC area. This included over 20 public statements related to situations in almost a dozen of countries all across the OSC region, including most recent developments, for instance, in the US, USA and in the Russian Federation. Our two ad hoc committees on migration and counterterrorism held several meetings and briefings online Migration activities focus on the humanitarian situation in Lesbos, as well as along the so-called Balkan migration route, on the implementation of the EU Pact on Migration and Asylum, including with briefings with the EU Commission and on human trafficking challenges. Our counterterrorism committee explored new, new terrorism and extremism related developments, particularly minding the possible impact of the pandemic on online radicalization. It also focused on providing support to victims of terrorism and on furthering our cooperation with external partners through joint planning and events. This has been a little bit in a, in, in a nutshell what has been the, uh, the, the main core of activities of, 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 of the Parliamentary Assembly. As, as you can see, this is very wide covering a whole a range of issues and I go back again to the possibility of the assembly in a, in a more flexible way compared to the governmental side to have a more let's say open agenda in terms of themes and in terms of um, possibilities to without the consensus rule address and, and, and provide some decisions that you can see in our in our declaration. Uh, regarding parliamentary diplomacy, which I think is quite important, I mean, uh, the, we, are, we are not alone here. The OECPA is, is, is part of uh, other groups of parliamentary assemblies of international organizations that provide a parliamentary input and parliamentary, what we call parliamentary diplomacy, where parliamentarians have the opportunity to, to influence and to be involved in the uh, in, 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 in international affairs, which has proven quite successful sometimes, as I mentioned before, being a little bit icebreakers, but also 
uh, because of the flexibility that is allowed to, to, to members of parliament. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated tensions all, all around the globe in addressing events where we try to offer to the parties involved as well as to the OSC conflict cycle toolbox, our strongest access, our political reach out capacity and our imp impartial platform for dialogue. However, we always left it entirely to the sides to decide on whether to make use of our channels or not. In working hand in hand with executive structures, uh, two examples are not worth it after the eruption of the crisis in Belarus last year. This is joining the OSC chairpersonship in office mediation offers. We have invited authorities and the opposition to a PA driven informal dialogue. Our bureau held a discussion with the head of the Belarusian delegation, as, as well as with a presidential candidate and opposition leader, which to date is the only platform where representatives of authorities and opposition actually engage in a debate. We're in constant contact with both sides and ready to replicate this positive experience if it can benefit the process. After the escalation of the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh, we proposed the same to our Azerbaijani and Armenian delegations, which unfortunately were not able to engage at that moment. However, we remain confident that the PA platform can turn useful in the coming months for the crucial phase of conflict rehabilitation and peace process if desired by both, by both sides. Now, we'll briefly refer, in light of my two predecessors in the, in the planner and the coordination with the, uh, with the OSC Troika and executive structures, which remain excellent, uh, including the above mentioned dossiers and takes place through our regular coordination at all levels of main political events, programmatic activities and positions. Uh, our Vienna Liaison Office continues to actively take part in all OSC meetings most of which now conducted remotely, of course. And now we come, um, I think what I would like to, to, to address based also on the, on the intervention by my, my predecessors on the call for action, the Helsinki Plus uh, 50 initiative. Uh, one of the um, points that was mentioned at the very beginning of the, uh, of, of the webinar today by Ambassador Lerke was what I, like very much of the of the approach of the Swedish chairman in this back to basics, uh, we need to let's say uh, bring back the spirit of the CSE of 1975, and we need to revitalize that now. And that the links also with what Ambassador Ulrich said about the political will, extremely important. Um, unfortunately, what we witnessed last year in terms of the organization was very worrying. Um, I, I remind everybody in July 2020. Uh, after participating states could not reach consensus on the reappointment of OEC heads of institution, it was acknowledged that while some of the challenges of the organization is facing are due to the overall crisis of multilateralism, others are of political nature and is strictly peculiar to the OSCE. And if you read uh, here is, is really the, uh, uh, the consensus rule. This is due to a complex interchange of factors which include why divergences and misperceptions on the OSCE's nature and increases mistrust between participating states and an overarching lack of a strategic political interest placed on it by its government. Again, what Ambassador Yula mentioned of, of, of political will that needs to come from the, uh, from the participating states. Hence, in a process triggered by our former president of the assembly, Mr. Seretelli, a member of parliament from Georgia, the OECPA offered its, its contribution, especially by leveraging on its significant other value of generating political thrust and raising political awareness to revive the work of the OEC and bring back high level political attention to it. General idea is to mobilize national parliamentary delegations, including international parliaments and vis-a-vis -vis their government to prove that the OEC is relevant also in the current international security framework and on the way towards the 50th anniversary of the Helsinki Final, Final Act in 2025. Parliamentarians can be vocal in flagging crucial political issues concerning the organizations, or for instance, engage on the level of participation of the country in the OSC, on the impl implementation of its commitments, on the reasons behind specific decisions. 
Such initiative is based on the complementarity of the OSC components and aims at providing the organization with the needed parliamentary support. In this way, the OSC can truly deliver as a whole. In the words of the OSC Secretary General Helga Schmidt, the, the OSC PA Bureau, which is the leadership of the Assembly, endorsed the, the, the project and already a call for action document uh, was presented last December 2020 during an, an event uh, dedicated to the 30th anniversary of the Charter of Paris and on the margins of the OSC Ministerial Council. Uh, this document, initiated by the OSC Parliamentary Assembly, has been signed by 52 among current and former OSC leaders. The document points to the need to strengthen the role of the OSC in addressing the contemporary challenges and to enhance its effectiveness including through the promotion of genuine political dialogue. Its aim is to serve as the basis for further work, including on the role of the Parliamentary Assembly. So again, the Assembly is already looking ahead. We're looking at 2025, the half century, the anniversary of the, uh, of the Helsinki Final Act, and, and again, to revitalize the organization, to bring what my predecessor, the director of the CPC, uh, called for political will, and to put the OSC again, um, give it the importance and the relevance that it deserves. And in this context, it's also very much welcome, uh, Fleming, what you are doing in your, in your institution to having this kind of um, this kind of webinars that, that give us the opportunity in the organization to, to reach out and, and present what is uh, what is at the uh, at the core of our of our work? I would like to conclude because I, when I my secretary general um, sent me the information about this webinar, and I really like the title that you have chosen: Gender, Conflict Settlement, and Democratization: Prospects and Challenges for the OSC Agenda. Uh, gender is at the core of the of 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 the work of the uh, of, of the parliamentary assembly as i mentioned we have a special re representative dr hedy fry member of parliament from canada extremely active and uh, and gender is always at the core of our uh, of, 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 of our of our work um, the OSCP has consistently called for the full implementation of the osc's 2004 action plan on the promotion of gender equality and United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325, an associated resolution, and urge OEC participating states to identify priorities, allocate necessary resources, and commit to government action to promote the meaningful participation in the settlement of international disputes and post-conflict peace building of a broad range of women with diverse life experiences, including racialized women, women with disabilities, and low-income women. This was at the center of the debate of, unfortunately, the, uh, the last annual session that we were able to hold in, um, in 2019, hosted by the Parliament of, of Luxembourg. As such, the Parliamentary Assembly has adopted a cornerstone resolution. Uh, let me just give you two examples. We have a resolution on promoting gender-inclusive and responsive mediation, which uh, was adopted at our annual session in Minsk in 2017, and also a resolution on women and girls made vulnerable by armed conflict, crisis, or minority status. And uh, this we adopted at our annual session in Helsinki. I will briefly highlight uh, some of the key recommendations made by, by the OSCE parliamentarians in those documents, just to give you an example, what is the result also of the work of the parliamentarians when, we, when they get together in this in this session. Um, these resolutions are a process of um, presentation by rapporteurs, debates, amendments. So the assembly works like, um, you would say, almost like, an, like a national parliament producing legislation, but of course, not really legislation, but a, a document that counts with the, uh, with the support, with the vote, with the input of parliamentarians from the 56 uh, participating states. Uh, in these resolutions, uh, we started by acknowledging the fact that situation of armed conflict and, and crisis affect women and men, boys and girls differently, and that gender inequalities are deepened and exacerbated by violence. We continue by recognizing the vital roles that women play in consolidating peace, 
including by promoting understanding and tolerance between different groups, and by noting that women's, women's limited engagement in mediation efforts heightens the risk of conflict relapse. A second aspect under scrutiny has been the prevention and response to sexual violence, exploitation, and abuse of women and girls, particularly in the context of conflict. This is what we made the following recommendations. First, participating states and the OSC personnel and representatives involved in mediation must ensure that equal opportunities exist for women to hold meaningful roles in decision-making as part of the mediation processes, including leadership position as mediators and lead negotiators, and that the inclusion of women is considered in the design of all mediation processes. Second, we ask participating states to ensure that the specific needs of women and girls are incorporated into all aspects of humanitarian assistance programming and that addressing violence against women and girls, including sexual violence, is prioritized. Third, we want to enhance educational and vocational training and economic opportunities for women and girls, especially those affected by armed conflict or crisis and those from minority groups as a means to reduce their vulnerability to violence, including sexual violence, exploitation, and abuse. With this say, uh, Fleming, I will get back to you, but uh, I just want to conclude again, stressing that the Parliamentary Assembly as an independent institution with the OSCE uh, provides a flexible approach to security issues within the, uh, the, the objectives of the, uh, of the organization, uh, precisely tries to, to bring back what the organization needs at the moment, that is, uh, let's say, political, political inputs in all the, the capitals of the 57 participating states. And again, thank you very much for inviting the assembly to participate in this panel today. Thank you, uh, Gustave, for this uh, very insightful, very broad introduction to uh, to the work that you do. And we understand also, of course, that this is a very important agenda. You highlight a number of issues that we all recognize. We all know that these are central in many ways to well-functioning, resilient societies. And um, and it gives us, of course, a, a much better understanding of, uh, of the work that you and your colleagues do. Before we go into some of the more critical issues, uh, let me just ask you a very practical question. Now, you mentioned the wide agenda and how you try to influence, in a way, parliamentarians, you bring together parliamentarians. How do you do this? Do you send out experts? Do you organize workshops? Understand from your presentation that sometimes perhaps the parliament will host a particular session on, on a particular topic and so on, but how do you, how do you bring these people together? Um, uh, 352 uh, parliamentarians and, and, and impact them with uh, impart them with this uh, with these different uh, different ideals. Yes, well, the, the the way the assembly works, each of the participating states in their own parliaments has the has has the right to to, to have a delegation in the parliamentary assembly. It's entirely up to each parliament to decide. Uh, in the rules of procedure, there is an allocated number. Mm -hmm. uh, of, uh, of, of members per delegation based, based on, uh, on population. So our largest delegation is that from the US and to that we go to the smaller ones from the microstates, San Marino, Andorra, and so, and, and, and so on with two from 17 members of the US to two members of, this, of these countries. These, uh, the, these members are selected internally. It's nothing to do with us in the Secretariat. They're selected internally by, by, by each parliament. They form the delegation and then they come to our statutory meetings. Um, the leadership of the assembly, the president and, 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 and the bureau usually um, uh, decide, let's say, on the, uh, on, the um, on, on, on general guidelines on the agenda of the assembly for the year. And then each, each of the committees has an elected rapporteur. Uh, these, uh, these, uh, the, these rapporteurs are the ones that are responsible to... Uh, to present reports and draft resolutions that constitute a little bit the, the debates during the annual mm -hmm. session. Apart from that, uh, delegations are free to come with freestanding resolutions 
that they at their own initiative and following a set of requirements in terms of signatures and support, they can bring up. And this works constitutes uh, during the, the annual session, which is the main meeting of the assembly, the focus of the, of the debates. So answering your question would rely a lot of the, of the initiative of, uh, of, 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 of individual, uh, indiv individual parliamentarians uh, that, that have their own, that, their own interest based also on their networking relationship with other with other parliamentarians, and I think this is also what is very important. I mean, one of the the important um, contributions of the assembly is precisely to create this network of me of, of members of parliament that have a, a very uh, let, let's say influential role when it comes to interna international issues and, uh, and, and and providing responses in some. Uh, to, to, to some specific situations where parliaments already have, let's say, a cadre of parliamentarians that know, know about these, uh, these issues, whether, whether it has to be conflicts, whether it has to be sometimes even purely budgetary, uh, bu budgetary issues with, parliament, with par national parliaments to have a say. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, let's turn to another issue. It was mentioned, for instance, by Ambassador uh, Lerke, and it, she referred to political backsliding in particular political backsliding during the COVID-19 pandemic. Is this a development that you recognize? Is it something that you have recorded that we see throughout the OEC area, perhaps a weakening of democratic institutions, perhaps of weakening of the quality of parliamentary work, uh, shortcuts, uh, a kind of political process that goes, runs counter perhaps to some of the work that you do on, on, on a daily basis. Uh, yes, thank, thank you, Fleming. This is a very good question, and it's actually one of the points I actually know yeah, that I underlined it from, from, from the ambassador's inter intervention, because this is something that we see very closely in the, uh, in the, in the OEC Parliamentary Assembly, and this is in, uh, let's say, um, throughout the whole OEC area. And uh, for this, you just need to, to see what, what, what is happening in all I would say in all our countries, I mean, we we are seeing more and more and the parliamentary assembly reflects in this delegation what happens in national elections in, in, in countries. Uh, you see more and more uh, also political parties uh, um, coming to elections with platforms that are advocating um, uh, policies uh, that are not necessarily um, Sometimes um, I, I would say even very, very democratic. Uh, mm -hmm. Not to say that we're fa that we're seeing and we're uh, witnessing uh, more and more um, um, nationalist platforms coming into 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 politics. Um, the issue of uh, multilateralism uh, being questioned, international organization very uh, questioned very. Uh, very directly, and this is uh, reflected more and more. And this is something that we see. We see in the assembly and national delegations um, uh, more and more um, have representatives for parties of very nationalist platforms and uh, that do not necessarily feel uh, that the, the OSCE, uh, for, um, for that matter, any other multilateral organization at the moment uh, should have a should have should have a, a relevance and, uh, and 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 this is something yes that um, that we're witnessing. Our job in the parliamentary assembly, of course, we work with the parliamentary delegations that are appoint, appointed for each participating uh, state in, fu in full in, in full respect. Uh, but uh, ag again, this is uh, this is a trend that we that we are seeing, and we're we're seeing that internally also in our in our debates. Our debates are very open. Uh, um, they are also, although they don't have a formal standing within the assembly, they are also political groups. Um, mm -hmm. uh, let's say representing different political ideologies, and um, and we see, and we and, and we have seen, and we have witnessed a more, let's say, um, let's. Um, Less international, more nationalistic uh, approach in, um, in 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 politics. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
And is this, and I, I realize, of course, this is very difficult for you to answer, but, but is this, in your opinion, a short-term process that has been sort of accelerated, uh, unleashed perhaps by the pandemic? Or do you see more fundamental processes uh, on the way that you recognized even before the pandemic and they may have been sort of exacerbated by, by, by the situation that we all find ourselves in now? Yes, I think in politics, and I think this is uh, affects. I mean, the, reflecting in our in, in all our parliaments, I think the the phenomenon of populism already already before the pandemic is something a common. Um, uh, it's been commonly spread in, the, in terms of politics. The traditional uh, traditional political parties, traditional uh, let's say uh, groupings, have been uh, replaced very fast by a new a, a, a new political dialogue, uh, more populist, uh, more simplistic in terms of approaches. I think this happened even before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. The pandemic definitely has not helped. In, uh, in many aspects, and one of them has to do precisely on communication. I think I think the, um, um, uh, uh, as Ujula mentioned it before, I mean the fact of these format, electronic formats, especially mm -hmm. in our in our work, that is the idea is to, to to have parliamentary dialogue, to bring parliamentarians together. The fact that in this past year we have not been able to actually physically have this has created the problem. Uh, has to do some parliaments from technical. The, 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 the difference in, in, in parliamentary support to, to, to members in terms of, of, of technical technical equipment, uh, participation issues with sometimes even as simple as, as having language and so on, mm -hmm. have not really been helpful in terms of uh, of promoting this uh, this dialogue. But again, I think the the, the process is from before the pandemic. Uh, and, and has to do with uh, with a with a more populist, more simplistic political dialogue and approach. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And 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 with this, of course, we're also reminded of the sort of the slogan, the headline of the Swedish chairpersonship, which is going back to basics. And perhaps we also need to remind ourselves of those basics and those fundamental political principles. Gustavo, we are running out of time, but let me just ask you a final question. And it uh, it relates also to to some of these fundamental processes. Now you mentioned uh, backsliding perhaps relating uh, to uh, the pandemic, more nationalistic, inward looking policies, perhaps something which also has broader aspects uh, uh, may have been witnessed even before the pandemic. Is this something that will affect your work? Now we, from our previous speakers, we also heard about, for instance, uh, politicization of the agenda. Uh, there may not be a, a, a will to use the full mandate to, to give the full mandate and to exploit the mandate. Do you see that this is something that will affect the work that, that, that you do, for instance, by making various parliaments or members of parliament uh, less willing to, to engage in the work that you do? Yes, I think I mean the, uh, uh, the 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 level of engagement that that we see. I think one one of the uh, assets of the uh, of, of the assembly is its it, its flexibility and its openness. So in that way, I mean, I think uh, this, uh, the the forum is always going to to be there. In terms of uh, in terms of challenges, yes, I think they. Uh, they are definitely ahead of us, and 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 again, I mean, the the diminishing role that we saw, let's say, in the I I would say from the uh, already from the from the from the nineteen nineties, where there was really uh, where parliaments really um, devoted a lot of time efforts for international issues. Uh, again, we see a more inward looking movement, but still, I think the engagement, uh, for, at least for what we see now, we will have our this year session is going to be of a remote nature. We just had the winter meeting or um, done for on, a, on, on, on a virtual. The engagement was, I think, I think, I, I think important. We see, uh, especially now on on uh, the the first in-person activities that we've been doing on election observation. There was there has been quite a, quite good participation and engagement. So I think in that in that way, I feel I I, I feel optimistic. I mean, the the idea is to to keep at least to keep the debate alive and to keep the opportunity to to keep debating and uh, and, and and in that way I do I do feel optimistic all what the challenges are there. Thank you for this and thank you for seeing of us uh, uh, us off on a positive note. Uh, 
the OEC, of course, uh, is an important organization because we are facing challenges and, and we've uh, read through a number of these challenges uh, uh, today, but it's very nice to, to finish off on a positive note. So thank you very much for this. Thank you uh, to all our speakers. Uh, Ambassador Petra Lerke from the Swedish uh, Chairpersonship, head of the Swedish uh, Task Force, uh, Ambassador uh, Pula Urgula, who is director of the uh, Conflict Prevention Center of the OC, and of course, 